you have the ability to resist the devil. You have the ability. But you have to start with something that some of us don't like. It's called submission. You have to begin by first submitting to God. If you don't submit to him, if you don't surrender to him, you can't go on to the next step of resisting the devil. We're going to look at James, the fourth chapter. We're in our series where we're continuing to talk about spiritual warfare. Um, I'm not going to vote on this because whether you believe it or not, there's demons around us. Okay? There's spiritual forces around us. Whether you believe it or not, whether you want to admit it or not, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, God is spirit being, is he not? <laughs> if God's out there, he has also angels out there, and the word of God tells us that a host of angels were thrown out of heaven because there was rebellion. And those angels are now referred to as what? As demons. And I'm sorry, you, we're not going to vote on this either. Did they all leave when Jesus rose from the dead? Did he take care of all of them? The fact is, no, he didn't. But we're not going to vote on these things because they're facts. And you don't vote on facts, do you? They simply are. They, they, it is truth that we need to deal with. James, the fourth chapter, verses 7 through 10. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Wow, that sounds weird, doesn't it? Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. A couple of points that I'm making today with the message. First off, successful resistance to Satan begins with submission to God. Resistance to Satan doesn't begin with you going after Satan and somehow you attacking him. It begins with surrender, submission to God. Too often we're independent and maybe even self-focused, which probably doesn't lend towards submission, does it? Our self-confidence, <laughs> we're going to make it on our own, our American pride, whatever else you want to call it, keeps us from completely surrendering and submitting to God. It's a word we don't really like, isn't it? One well, important point I want you to think of this morning is this. Resistance to evil requires a broken heart. A truly broken heart for God. Think about that as we continue. See, as we open this text, many of us, we, we, we jump past the very first phrase. Submit to God. And we jump on to, we're just going to resist devil. And we're going to go out there and do it on our own. And therefore, we've already missed the most important piece of this message of this text. Surrender to God. If you don't submit to God, you won't have the power to resist the devil. Do you realize that? If you don't first surrender to him, you're not going to be able to defeat evil and darkness in your life. Submission and surrender are part of the steps to resisting the devil. Now there's a promise that comes with that. If you surrender to God and you resist the devil, there's two steps there, right? Then what's, this, what's the word say gonna, the devil's going to do? He's going to flee. He's going to leave. His minions, his demons, they will move away. They will take off if you first surrender to God. Isn't that what worship should be about? First off, surrendering to God, then resisting the devil. He takes off and now we're able to honor God. I want you to think about the meaning of submission before you ignore this very important point. To, to submit means to be aligned under the authority of God. When you submit, you're assuming your proper position under God. Can you imagine? Imagine a firefighter coming to your house. There's a fire burning inside there. 
And, and you say to that firefighter, follow me. He puts on his equipment or she. They put on their oxygen tent and their mask and their helmet and they get their hose and their axe or whatever else they're going to carry in there with them. And then you say, all right, are you ready? Follow me into the fire. Do you realize how stupid that would be? And yet some of us are doing that. We're saying, hey, God, you become with me as I try to do battle with my world and the evil in my world. To, to submit means to line yourself up behind God, not God behind you. Put yourself behind God. God's leading the way. To, to, it means to subor subordinate yourself to God that you can obey him. See, too often we're telling God what to do. It's true, isn't it? You think about it. Think about your prayers. Analyze your prayers. How many of your prayers are you asking God, you telling God, here's God what you should do? Like, he doesn't know the, way, the, the right plans, right? He's not strategically thinking like you are about your life. He, you're better at this. And so you say, here, God, you line up behind me. I'll tell you how you can handle this one. And he's saying, like, really? <laughs> really? I have wisdom, but you want me to do what you, th okay. I think we got this all wrong, but just, to submit means to put yourself under God's orders and his chain of commands. Are you guys learning that, students? <laughs> when M Mrs. Durbeck speaks, do you respond? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't, what happens? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when Mr. Durbeck says run, you say no. <laughs> don't think I will today. Um, uh, don't feel like it. I'm kind of tired. Want to take a nap. Yeah, that'll work, won't it? <laughs> for, for those of you who don't know, Mr. and Mrs. Durbeck run the Northwestern Preparatory Academy. Now, Mr. Durbeck does the, actually the PT for them. He's getting them ready. Did you run Lover's Lane yet? Today? Oh, boy, he's being nice on you. <laughs> take, taking it easy. You're on doing wind sprints and stuff like that, huh? He's really being soft this year. I don't know what happened to him. But... but <laughs> But, but he, the, the two of them, the Mrs. Durbeck, and they're, what they're doing is they're, they're teaching these students about military lifestyle, which means if, if any of you speak to them guys, right, when, when you speak to the one of the students, what do they say to you? They say, yes, sir, don't they? <laughs> right? I mean, I realize I'm old, but it still kind of makes me uncomfortable every time they say it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> But, but why? Because, students, you've been learning this, right? The, the importance of sub subordinating yourself, lining up behind authority, doing as you are instructed to do. And you're really going to learn that when you get to the academies and when you go through all your training. You're going to learn the importance because especially those of you who are going to be leaders have to also learn to subordinate to others, don't you? And you have to understand these lines of authority. And why don't we understand the lines of authority that God is here and we want to line up behind him rather than saying, God, come with me as I'm doing what I'm ever I'm doing. Or here's what's even worse. Some of us are simply doing what we're doing and never even inviting God in. There is no surrender at times for us. Here, here's the part that we don't like about surrender. Submission. It means giving over your rights giving over your rights or your will to God. Doesn't the alcoholic believe I have a right to drink? The adulterer believes I have a right to be happy. The student says I have a right to have fun or I have a right to have sex. And Satan and sin defeat us because we think we should demand these rights. And he knows it. And we demand our rights rather than giving our rights to God. Where does, where does James begin? Surrender. Submit to God. Incidentally, the, the old Webster's Dictionary said it this way. Had a, it had a just a great definition of submission. It says, the act of yielding to power or authority, surrender of the person and power to the control or government of another, a yielding of one's will to the will or appointment of a superior, now get this one, without murmuring. 
You know, some of us, you know, okay, yes, sir. But inside, you know, you're a dumb leader. I don't really trust you. you know, whatever other comments might be. We're murmuring away. But to really submit, to really surrender is to do it without murmuring. Can you imagine what would happen? You go into the battlefield. The commander tells you to march forward immediately. And you say, well, I'm not sure I want to. You're told to shoot. Now, fire. And, or like the, the, you've seen the commercial, right? Fire at will, right? And the, and the pigeons are talking like, oh, who's Will? How'd you know he was Will? And they're going in that conversation. How, can you imagine? You're, you're told to do something, and you're going to discuss it? Well, that's kind of what we do with God sometimes, though, isn't it? You see, entire and cheerful submission to the will of God is a duty. It's a duty if we, if we really want to experience God's work in our lives. Spurgeon said it this way, if you are to have peace with God, there must be war with Satan. He continued in another message, Submit then, my brethren, beseech the Holy Spirit to bow your wills to complete subjection. Then you will never be happy till self is dethroned. I know some of God's children who are in great trouble only because they will not yield to the divine will of God. Is that you? Arnold Fruchtenbaum explains that every time a believer sins, he is rebelling against God and is not subject to him, not submissive to him. Therefore, he must submit himself to God, and the means of doing so is by confession of sins. What does he say? Submit to God. And when you submit to God, then now you're ready for the next step. Resist the devil. Now, I already warned you that some time ago that technically we're not really dealing with Satan, are we? So in this sense, the devil is, is a personification for any form of evil. And, and when you're battling evil, and it could be demonic, it could be temptation, it could be anything like that going on. But when you're going to battle evil, the way to battle evil is first off, submit to God. Then resist. Fight back. Say no. Resist the devil. And what does he say? He will flee from you. How many of you really like conviction? Really like to feel bad about things that you're doing wrong? Somebody said, I don't remember who it was, says, being broken is both God's work and ours. He brings his pressure to bear, but we have to make the choice. If we are really open to conviction as we seek fellowship with God, God will show us the expressions of this proud, hard self that cause him pain. Then we can stiffen our necks and refuse to repent, or we can bow the head and say, yes, Lord. See, brokenness, something that we have to do in order to resist the devil, takes brokenness on our part. We're going to talk about that in a few moments, but before I get there, let me go back to this other phrase, resist the devil. Resist the devil. See, see, this is the other side of that the very basic command. Submit to God and do, and what? And resist the devil. Submit first, then resist. Don't run. Notice that. He didn't say, submit to God and then run from the devil before he gets you. Right? What does he say? Turn and face the enemy. Face that enemy, submit first, then resist the devil. There's no middle ground. There's no neutrality here. There's no whole half-hearted kind of, you know, well, I'm going to maybe follow God, and then I'll maybe fight Satan. You, it's a commitment that you're making. Stand up against him decisively and say, no, I'm not going to follow. How do you do that? Well, haven't we been studying that from Ephesians 6? Do, do you remember the phrases? Finally, be strong in the Lord. Take up the whole armor of God that you may do what? So that you can run and get away before he attacks you, right? He says, take up the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. The shield of faith, the, the, peace, the peace on your feet, the breastplate of righteousness, your loins girded with truth. Uh, and, and also, take up that helmet of salvation. It's going to cover your thoughts. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and start praying. He says, take up that whole armor so that you can what? So that you can stand against the, the evil. 
and keep on standing. In other words, so that you can resist and not give in. So that you can fight and have victory. Submit to God and stand still with the armor that God's given you and fight back. Don't run and give in. Warren Wearsby said, before we can stand before Satan, we must bow before God. The illustration that I found recently about coyotes. And there was this lady who had this um, ranch with, a, with sheep on it. And the sheep kept getting killed constantly by the coyotes. Coyotes come in, attack a sheep. The sheep turns around and growls at them, right? <laughs> Doesn't happen. <laughs> the sheep just get attacked. And so she tried to do all different kinds of things to try to take care of her sheep and try to protect them. This lady's name was Lexi Fowler. Um, she tried all kinds of things like this. She used odor sprays, electric fences. She even had what were called scare coyotes. I think they were fake coyotes supposed to be out there to scare the other coyotes. I don't know what they were supposed to do. She tried sleeping with her lambs. During the summer, she placed battery-operated radios near them. She had corralled them at night, herded them at day, but the southern Montana rancher lost scores of lambs. In fact, in one year alone, she lost 50 lambs. Until she finally found something that would work. And you know what it was? She found llamas. Llamas. Why a llama? Because a llama is not afraid of anything. A llama, instead of running, turns and is aggressive turns towards its enemy. That whatever's trying to attack it, it faces it head on. And coyotes don't seem to like that. They don't like aggressive behaviors. It's, so that's why they attack lambs, isn't it? <laughs> so when there's a, then an aggressive llama coming at you, what does the coyote do? Exactly what James says the devil will do, evil will do. That if you resist him, if you aggressively turn at him, if you first submit to God and say, God, I'm you're with me. God, you lead me in here. And God, let's resist this evil. And what happens? Devil flees. That's what the coyotes do. Interesting how nature can kind of lead us and teach us. <clears throat> Ralph Martin says we are to desist from aligning with the devil. And friendship with the world and surrender to God. Let's back up, by the way. We read James 4, 1, 6 and 5. Look at the first five verses of James 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Uh, have any of you started that stress yet with the other students? Any church people, any couples here have any stress, start to fight with yeah. one another? Yeah. Oh, okay, it's just one honest one. <laughs> but it's just you, not him, right? Oh, yeah, it's just, it's just me. I knew it, Wendy. <laughs> what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. And by the way, you don't have to just kill by shooting somebody or taking their life. You can kill with your words and your thoughts, maybe even worse. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Just, you want your way, right? <laughs> you covet and don't get what you want since you're not getting your way, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God because you know that it's your way and you, it'd be stupid to ask God for that because you know he, he'd say, like, why do you want that, right? You're being selfish or something like that. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? 
And then he says, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, look, he's talking about how, how self-centered we get with things, how we give in to battles, and, and we, frankly, are inviting this spiritual battle coming into our life because of our self-centered thinking. What, is Paul, what does James say next? Resist the devil. He will flee from you. And then look at the text again, verse 8. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Then he has this interesting thing. He says, you've got to wash your hands. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. In Psalm 63, David said, Oh God, you're my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. God, I want you. Come near to God. And do not hide, Psalm 69, and do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Answer me quickly. Oh, draw near to my soul and redeem it. Ransom me because of my enemies. I'm going to take you back to our text, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. He says, come near to God. Come near to God. But now there's some steps that help you to take if you're going to come near to God. What do you got to do? Well, coming near to God starts with repentance, doesn't it? with a cleaning of your hands, as James said it, with a purifying of your hearts. Uh, Lehman Strauss writes this. He says, my Christian friends, James is speaking to us as well as to the Christians of his own day, and he calls us sinners and double-minded men and women. Too often we give way to the soft, sentimental jargon that winks at the sins of saints. You and I need God's presence in these days. And the need will increase with the passing of time, but we cannot expect God to draw nigh to us if we fail to draw nigh to him. And we cannot draw nigh to him with soiled hands and stained hearts. And he goes on, all hypocrisy and double-mindedness must be put aside. What do we need to do in order to come near to God? Well, this is going to probably surprise you. But what James says is we need to grieve. We need to grieve. We need to grieve for our sin. If you've been in this church very long, you've, you've heard me say how important it is if somebody has sinned against you, wronged you, and this could be something really serious. Somebody might have abused you, assaulted you, done something terribly bad to you. But in order for you to heal, you need to forgive them. But I don't say that lightly because when I say that, I'm talking about forgiveness means I'm going to let go of the yuck, the garbage, the stinky trash, the smelly sin that that person committed. I'm not going to hold on to it any longer. And one of the saddest things about someone else's sin and what they've done to us is they've long forgotten it and moved on. And we're sitting there, we're, we're, we're bitter, we're hurt, we're wounded, we've got this scar inside of us, and the worse the wrong, the more we're holding on to it, and they're just going on having their own happy day. Forgiveness is not about setting that other person free. Forgiveness is about setting me free from what somebody has done to me. When I forgive, I'm saying, God, you may have to do this for me. I got to let go of this stinky garbage that this other person, this wrong that this other person has done to me. I got to let go of it because it's messing me up. It's destroying me. I've got resentment. I've got bitterness. I've got pain that's continuing because of this other person's wrong. God, help me to forgive. To forgive. To let go. To no longer hold on to that person's wrong. You may even have to literally pray, Jesus, boy, and if you've been sexually abused, you may have to say, Jesus, I, there's no way I can do it. So Jesus, you need to forgive this person for me. You do for me what I can't do because there's some things that are just so hard, so impossible. Jesus, you forgive this person and do it through me. 
And then you let go of that trash. You let go of that garbage. You let go of that sin that that person committed. Forgiveness sets you free. Reconciliation is what brings us back together, not forgiveness. Forgiveness lets go of the, the past. Reconciliation, however, can only happen, now listen carefully, reconciliation can only happen when the person who has wronged you understands the pain they caused you. Did you hear that? Reconciliation doesn't happen because, okay, I forgive you, we're back together. No, actually, I forgive you. It says now you've got to take responsibility for what you did. Reconciliation says that other person realizes, I abused you. I hurt you so deeply. I hurt you so deeply, I can't even say, forgive me. Because I'm now understanding what pain I've caused you, what wrong I did to you. And for re reconciliation can't happen until that other person understands it. Now let's look at that in our relationship with God. Reconciliation and the real power of God to defeat evil comes when we grieve. When we start to understand the pain that we caused God with our sin. The Amplified Version of this text says, as you draw near to God, be deeply penitent and grieve, even weep over your disloyalty to God. <laughs> Another way of saying that, you gotta be miserable. You, you need to become miserable. You need to mourn. Isn't that, I mean, if you, anybody has ever really mourned, have you, have you had those, you know, just those tears that just won't stop, that, that pain from inside that just, it, it's unending, the, the grief that just won't let go of you. MacArthur notes that in Greek, there's nine words that express sorrow. But of the, of the nine terms used for sorrow, the one used here, pentheo, or mourn, is the strongest and most severe form of sorrow. It represents the deepest, most heartfelt grief and was generally reserved for grieving over the death of a loved one. The word carries the idea of deep inner agony, which may or not be expressed by outward weeping, wailing, or lament. Have you ever been there when somebody's lost a loved one? Too many times because of my work as a chaplain in the fire department, I've had to go on the scene where teenagers committed suicide. Or even like just the recent call, the 80-year-old man, a former dentist, died right there with his family. Have you ever grieved like that? Where you, you come on scene and the people are literally just wailing. The, the pain is just so intense that they can do nothing but just cry. And what, what James is saying is that's where we need to get with our sin and God. We need to come to a place where we grieve over our sin. Psalm 51, 17, David said the sacrifices of God are what? A broken spirit. A broken spirit and contrite heart. In, in, in the English, that means to be, to have a bruised, broken-hearted for sin, deeply affected with grief and sorrow for having offended God. That takes us to humility. That, as David said, is a heart, O oh God, thou will not despise. In Psalm 51, we read that God is pleased with a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, have you ever wondered why that pleases God? Why does it please God for us to be broken? Because he knows that that is the path to healing. He knows it is the road to freedom. And he knows that anything less than that will hold us into a form of bondage. The guilt, the shame, the embarrassment, it will want to continue to plague us. He knows that the demons will try to continue to put it in front of us. And he knows
knows that if we will break our hearts, if we'll humble ourselves before him, that then we're ready to be set free. And I have to wonder that since God knows that, how important broke, being broken is, why don't we pray to be broken? Why don't we ask God, break us? See, I still remember the day when I was in a form of rebellion against God and was dangerously close to losing my marriage. And I finally started praying a prayer that I didn't want to pray. And the prayer was, God, break me. God, break me. See, it's a dangerous prayer, isn't it? Because when you pray it and you really mean it, God might do it. And he might not tell you what he's going to do to do it. And you might have to go through a real tough process. But when you pray that prayer honestly, when you're really willing to say, God, break me. God loves us so much, he will. He cares so much about us, he wants us to be free. Why don't we pray, God, break me? One of the things that the cross proves for us is that sin troubles God. It bothers him so much that he is willing to die on a cross in order to set us free from it. Sin deeply bothers God. Shouldn't it bother us at least as much? Or do, are we simply going to give in, oh, well, yeah, that's just a, that's a minor sin. <laughs> there is no such thing as a minor sin with God. Sin causes such pain inside of God that he goes and he's willing to die a horrible death in order to free us from that sin. And the question we have to ask ourselves, does it trouble us? Does our sin trouble us? Bill, you're supposed to preach good, happy thoughts on your own Sunday. You know, we come here for refreshment. We come here to get a break from the studies. We come here to get away from all the world and all this hard things out there. So you're just supposed to preach happy things. Well, guess what? The road to happiness, the road to freedom, the road to abundant life, the road to joy comes not by ignoring your sin. It comes by being broken over your sin and letting Jesus set you free. So grieve and mourn. You see, Jesus suffered and he died because of your sin and because your sin was so, so hurtful and my sin so hurtful that God dies on that cross. What do we have to do? Now read the text again. And what does he say first? Submit to God. Some of us are not having victory over sin. We wonder why we can't defeat that habit, why we can't break that thing that's in our life, and it's because we're not starting with point one. Submit to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Grieve, mourn, wail if you have to. Wash your hands, get purified, and God will set you free. It's time to pray again. It's time to pray for you. So would you please bow your head? And again, this is not the time. If, if you've got to go to the potty, hold it. This is not the time to get up. This is the time to, for you to work with God right now. Close your eyes so that your attention's just on him. Have you submitted fully to God today? And are you willing to say, God, break me. Break me. Cause me to grieve over what you grieve for, Lord. 
Cause me to be sad. Cause me to even weep for what you weep for, Lord. Break me. And then, Lord, clean me. Wash me and I shall be as white as snow. Wash me, Jesus, and set me free. And then, God, lead me into battle to stand against the evil, to stand and not run, to resist the temptation, to resist the dark. Lead me into battle, Jesus. Will you pray that? Maybe you're saying, I don't know if I've ever submitted to Jesus completely. I invite you to do that right now. You've never submitted your life to Jesus? Well, maybe you've even gone to church a whole long time. But you've never submitted to Jesus? Go ahead. Tell Jesus you want him to lead your life. You're going to trust him to be in control rather than you. Yes, him to be in control rather than you. Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead to give us life. So submit. Surrender. Yield. <laughs> it's the road to victory.